good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I think we should start. My name is Vlado Cetle from GRC, and it will be my pleasure to chair this interesting session. Uh, we will have five presentations in this session, and um, we decided to go for the questions after the all presentations. So first in a row we will have just presentations, and then at the end I think we will have uh, 15 minutes or even more for the questions and, and discussions. So we will start with Mr. Patrick Hogan, and so I invite him to, to take the floor and to start with the first uh, presentation. We also have a slightly this order or make new order in this session so because Patrick has two presentations if you look at the agenda so he will have immediately both in in a row uh, presentations so Patrick please floor is yours so good afternoon uh, you're just in time for the siesta <laughs> uh, and that was it now we're back to work again so I um, I'm really uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Barcelona. Um, it's a great pleasure to be associated with Inspire. Um, the first uh, time that I was associated with uh, JRC was in 2013, and that was in Florence at the Inspire conference there. What a way to start things off. So uh, a long and, and uh, healthy relationship with JRC. Um, today I'm going to present uh, two different presentations in order, so keep an eye on my time. Would you let me know when I've got uh, 15 minutes done for the first one and then 15 for the second one, but maybe every five and something so I can keep an eye on this. But um, what I want to do is I want to have some fun here. I want you, th this, uh, these conferences classically are for show and tell. Unfortunately, they mostly end up as tell and very little show. And I want to do some show. Um, the, Inspire Directive has been a architecture for data. And we have been for years talking about data and getting it delivered and making it accessible. Um, and I, I, I think that we're, we're, we're continuing in that vein and I don't think we're doing enough in terms of actionable results. And so uh, I want to talk to that a little bit in terms of orienting our our results, um, our measure of success a little bit differently. So I'm going to start off by providing what I think is a solution for the data delivery platform. If we could find one place that's the spatial, geospatial, the spatial piazza. I'm looking for a spatial piazza where all of us can gather and exchange information, spatial information, have a conversation, even better, what if we could actually share solutions, discuss problems and share solutions that are solving the same problems we all have? I'm gonna to speak to that after I talk about this particular platform that I think is what I would consider the spatial piazza. It, Worldwind does the heavy lifting for 3D pixels. If you want to see your planetary data, if you want to see it, then you go get whatever data you need, you build whatever application you want in terms of analysis of the data, and the visualization part, the heavy lifting for representing 3D pixels in that virtual globe space, that's what Whirlwind is there for. And it would be spectacular if the world could actually congregate around one spatial piazza so that we can all together have one place where we share the data and all the intelligence, all the, whether it's proprietary, whether it's government, whether it's open source, whatever it is, that's something else. That should be uh, done in, in the most creative and innovative ways. But to get to those places where you're just spending your time on the intelligence and the innovation, you don't want to have to be dealing with the virtual globe that delivers those pixels. And so that's the theme behind Whirlwind. Um, and if I might just say something personal, I'm uh, 30 years ago, I was a high school science teacher. I've been with NASA now for 25 years. I'm a geologist by trade. And the, their opportunity arose in 2002 
to manage a program called NASA Learning Technologies. And I said, man, I gotta have that job. So I told my boss, I have to have that job. And I got it. And so for the next four years, I was building something that was supposed to be the vehicle for delivering NASA content into the classroom. So in 2002, we started building the first open source virtual globe that was supposed to, excuse me, supposed to be making data available to everyone um, and doing whatever they want to do with it, proprietary and open. You could take Whirlwind and build an entirely proprietary applications. Whirlwind is an SDK, a software development kit. So you build your application. If you need to see that data in its virtual globe context, you plug it in. It does not touch the proprietary nature of your application. So that's the beauty of this particular technology. The other beautiful thing about this technology is that it's API-centric, application programming interface centric, which means as the SDK gets more sophisticated and you want to plug it into your, you want to get access to the latest of the, the technology that's being developed in that SDK, you can simply plug it into your application and now you have access to the latest. So this has been very carefully thought through in terms of the architecture and its whole purpose is to provide a platform for you to be freed up to innovate with the data. So introduction done. Um, see if I push this button can move forward. The important message with this particular slide is this. European Space Agency and NASA together are building the World Wind Platform. This is a joint effort between the European Space Agency and NASA to provide a spatial data platform, the virtual globe. So jointly we are putting this together giving it to the world to actually do whatever needs to be done with it. What is WorldWind? I've, I've told you just a moment ago, but here it is in, in black and white. I think the important note here might be right here. WorldWind is in Java. As of 2006, we've had it in Java. It is also in JavaScript. That's about two years old. It's in Android, that's about four years old, and actually we have a brand new version of, of Android. And um, we have an iOS version which we're not doing much with. If you want access to this technology, it's on GitHub. You go to GitHub and do go to uh, NASA WorldWind, and boom, you'll be there and have access to the Java version, the JavaScript, and the Android version. All three platforms are there, so for you to take advantage of. What does it do? It does all the things you need to do with spatial data, including doing a lot of, it's got a lot of tools that will actually give you a head start into doing the kind of work that you're trying to do with the data. And who uses it? Well, just to give you a sense of a level of confidence so that you're not alone in picking this technology up. Obviously, ESA is using it, NASA is using it. Um, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration is how they manage their air operations. The Missile Defense Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, a lot of DOD entities, and a wide array of national governments are using it as well. It's also being used by the UN, I know for a fact, in managing um, the Locust Intervention Program on hundreds of tablets, Android tablets, throughout North Africa to keep an eye on Locust activity, also being used by NATO. In terms of private enterprises, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, um, the French aerospace and defense company, Thales, these folks have all standardized on this platform. That's some serious customers, so you're in good company, so to speak, in terms of the business sense, and these folks um, are using Whirlwind. Um, this is the fun, the fun part of Whirlwind is that, yes, it's a virtual globe, it's a 3D virtual globe, but it also is operates in 2D, so if you want to switch to a Mercator view and see the whole world at once, you just click a button, and you're now in 2D. And you're not just in 2D, you're actually in 2D with terrain. So as you can see, there's three dimensionality to this. So you get it in 2D view, but you're actually, the terrain is still in 3D. So you can, you can have your, as they say, you can have your, you can eat your cake and have it too. Um, the other part is the classic view. This is up close. Any one of these items um, that you're seeing here is, uh, can be clicked on and 
you can bring up balloons that uh, operate as a full HTML web page. So the power of being a, a program within a program, it's all just made available to you with the platform, the Whirlwind platform. This was fun. A company put together a flight simulator. This happens to be an F, a fully instrumented F-16. So you can also have fun with Whirlwind platform and, and do other creative game-like things with it. Um, this is JSAT track. This is multi-window. What's nice about this is the efficiency of this particular view. Every one of those world views, so it's drawing from one data source. So you're not having to load up a bunch of different worlds and weigh down the GPU of your computer. So you get a 3D view of, of the International Space Station. You can see where its, its track is. Um, you can see where it's been in the 2D view. So here's the, the 2D view along with the 3D view and glorious 3D view in terms of the full, fully implemented model of the International Space Station or whatever model that you have that you want to represent. Whirlwind is not an app. It's the technology. It is any app you want. So it's whatever you want, that's the app that Whirlwind is. Um, just some more of the, the folks who are using it and how they're using it in a, more, a, mo a most sophisticated way. If you click on any one of those things in their particular application, you bring up the particular aircraft, you can see its schedule, you can see its rate of speed, you can see um, the type of aircraft, you can see they've got it rigged so that you can actually see the cockpit in terms of what cockpit is there, not the actual cockpit that's you know, at the time. But the dimension in terms of doing things with this technology is unlimited. Um, we've just recently, the United States Geological Survey has just asked us to open up the subsurface because they wanted to have aquifers and, and water well data and seismic data in the subsurface. So uh, we've opened that up and hopefully we'll have a demonstration here to allow you to see some of that in action. Um, interactive analysis, and I mentioned it's important to mention because you couldn't do this with Google Earth. You cannot interact with the data, live data in Google Earth. You'd have to extract it, do something with it, create a KML, and put it back in. And by that time, you know, an infinite amount of, of calculations have been made with Whirlwind and visualized at the same time. Interacts with terrain. This is just a graph of the terrain. And if you move the line, the, the, that graph would change. Just some trying to stress the, inter, the dynamic interactivity of the technology, of the platform. Um, more of that interactivity with buildings and terrain. So if you wanted to see the uh, line of sight and the shadow thereof, um, it provides those tools with the technology. You don't have to build it. You just take advantage of that, of that capability that's in the program. Um, just to give you a sense of the architecture, there, tell me one software program that's over 10 years old that has not had to be rewritten. Whirlwind has not had to be rewritten. We have architected this as modular componentry. We've advanced it, made it more sophisticated, highly more, much more optimized, and yet because the pieces are all separate and yet fitting together nicely, the particular architecture and the brains behind putting this together have been very carefully thought out. This is first class technology, and actually if you're teaching a software programming class, Whirlwind's actually been used very often in a software development class to teach good architecture, good programming style. So, um, just a note. Any data source, any data type. And that's why I get, you know, we're, we keep talking about data access, data access. Let's get past the data access. We've got data access. Let's start showing what we're doing with the data, and let's start sharing with each other those analytical routines that are doing constructive, important things with the data. Any platform. This is an important one to appreciate. In other words, Whirlwind, no matter where you want to be, you're there. No matter what platform you need to be on, Whirlwind is ready to be there with you. And, and what I love about my job is that I get to build this and do what I think government needs to do, and that is provide the tools and the wherewithal for innovation, creativity, whether it's business or open source, to actually be unlimited in terms of where they can go and what they can do. And believe me, we need some help in terms of what is being done with the data and where we need to go right now. Features. 
this is stuff that you get with the program. You don't have to build these capabilities or these functionalities. You can just leverage them. So these are, these are some pretty powerful tools that come with it. Just to give you an idea of things you can do in terms of visualization. Um, again, you know, that full HTML balloon inside of a uh, HTML capability inside of a, a, a simple balloon, text balloon. Just more dimensionality to it. Multi-window. These windows can be synced or unsynced. Hopefully we'll get a chance to show you how it works when they're synced. So that if you're looking at something in one window and move it, it actually moves in the other, whatever place you have it in terms of that view. Again. European Space Agency and NASA working together. This is an international collaboration to build a platform that you all will have available to you to do whatever it is that you need to do. Um, fully extensible at any functionality, the world's first and oldest open source virtual globe. And this is just kind of the last slide to kind of put, bring it all together. So how much time have we got right now? That's 15? Okay. All right, good deal. So, um, when I'm, this next one we're going to take go through really like two minutes to get through, but I feel it's important to mention. It's something that's really close to me. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of five-year-olds, and I want them to have a full life. And right now, they're not going to have one, in my meager estimation. As a scientist, I'm saying. This place right now, if you look at it, and look at, it looks like a planet. But life on this planet is just occupies a very filamentous part. It's like a membrane around the very thinnest part of the surface of this planet. And right now, we are abusing that in an extraordinary manner. This little girl right here, this is when she's three and a half years old. She's my niece. This is her first full lap. Oh, thanks. This is her first full lap. And um, she, it was right around this time that she came home, was talking to her mom, and she says, Mom, I'm not going to clean my room anymore. And the mother's like, wow, that's interesting. Um, why are you not going to clean your room anymore? She says, because I'm a rock star, and rock stars don't clean their rooms. And she says, Sax, yes, they do. She says, Mom, you're not telling me the truth. This is one smart little kid. So the fact that we are generating an extraordinary amount of waste that's going into the atmosphere, that's everything we throw on the ground, it's going to the storm sewer, out to the sea, and this is what it looks like firsthand. We are generating an extraordinary amount of garbage, and we're breathing it. It's like we're treating, we're treating our our, our home like it was some kind of toilet. We cannot generate energy fast enough. We cannot consume our resources fast enough. We're actually picking up speed. This is what it looks like on a planetary level if you go find all that plastic which does not degrade ever. Cigarette butts themselves are 97% plastic. All of that's going out there into the ocean. I'm going to show you a couple birds that were collected a little bit north of Hawaii as a result of this, that's what it looks like firsthand. And it's not just the birds. It's the dolphins, it's the whales, it's the fish. Everything out there, they see a little something that's colorful, it's interesting, they eat it. They expect it to be okay. This is what we're doing. We're rock stars. We are rock stars, baby. And we've only been here for 150,000 years. We're the, we're the youngest species on the planet, just about, if not. And, and we're, we're trashing the joint, and we're abusing everything on it in the process. This is, can you imagine a critter having to live with that until they die? It's horrifying. And, you know, this is something that got caught early on and had to grow up with it. What the hell are we doing? We're completely out of our minds. So up close, this is what happens. And then we try and do something good about it, but it's a pinprick. This is what it looks like on a planetary scale. Old news, everybody. You all know this. We're up over 400 parts per million now. You all know this, which is about, well, it's literally 40% higher than the 280 that we're normally at. 
but we're, we're rapidly going further. And it's not just the CO2. We're warming the planet up enough so that we're going to release the methane. And when the methane, which has already started coming out of, of the subarctic, when that picks up speed, all bets are off. Hasta la vista, baby. You're not stopping this train wreck from happening. And right now, we're on track for that. Not during our children's lifetime exclusively. During our own lifetime. Hello. So there it is, the hockey stick, picking up speed, steepening, just more the sea levels going up as well. So CO2, temperature, sea level. Right now, our rate of species loss is greater than any extinction event, major extinction event in the history of this planet. Over 100 species a day. And it's estimated that it's much higher than that. That's a conservative estimate. It's much worse than that. We're in trouble. We're next. We've, 33,000 33, of these guys die a year due to loss of habitat and, and poaching. And they're expected to be hasta la vista baby by 2020 or somewhere near after that. These are, these are extraordinarily sensitive creatures. We got no business messing with them like this. So, Anyway, I think, yeah, here it is. Oh, I think I missed a slide. Yeah, we're clearing forests. If you, if you wonder why are we clearing forests, most of the clearing, you know, where they clear cut forests and they go down, what do you do with that? We farm on it. What do we farm on it primarily? Cows. And the, the, the soil is so alkaline, it's usually only good for a few years of, of grazing cattle. So most of it's going for cows. So that's why, how many species do we really need? Just chickens <laughs> and a few burgers. Um, this is my favorite. Poor Earth. God. So anyway, the good news is, hey, we can do something about this now. 2040 is an interesting year. The UN has estimated the fisheries will be gone in 2050. Total collapse. If the UN thinks the fisheries are gone in 2050, guess what? <laughs> it's, we're going to hit the bitter end a lot sooner. So anyway. Global ecological footprint, we're, we're living beyond our means aggressively and picking up speed. And that's it. So I want to go to the next presentation, which is supposedly solutions. How many minutes do I have? Ten? Yeah, Good. Thanks. So we're going to do a video. I'm just going to have people submit a technology presentation. Okay. Depend on this. All right. We're not going to have time. Do it. Okay, so the Europa Challenge we put together because we wanted solutions. I thought the best way to do this was challenge our kids, our university level kids to deliver solutions. So here's the technology, please do something constructive with it. So we've challenged them to do this. This is the fourth year and the, um, and the results have been phenomenal. I would love to work with Inspire and JRC to actually make a bigger deal out of this Europa Challenge and ask all of our university kids to focus on solving problems with inspire data. So every city needs the same data management tools that every other city needs. Why can't we be building those functionalities, sharing them, and urban management is where the action is right now. We've got to figure out how to handle water. We've got to figure out how to handle agriculture. We've got to figure out how to localize energy. We've got to handle you know, the sewer and power distribution. Every city's got to do the exact same thing. Let's build something together. Let's have reason for all the cities of the world to be talking with each other. We're not getting leadership from the top down. Maybe we'll get it by sharing solutions from the bottom up. Cities, the smallest element of society, let's let these cities work together and build what we need. So we have this Europa Challenge. This past year, GB SIG Online and GB SIG Desktop. This is the Java version of Whirlwind. They've integrated that into their very sophisticated database and it now is providing, you just, you want to see that data in its 3D view, boom, you just push a button and there it is. They've, now they also have done it with the web version of Whirlwind, so 100% open source. These people are doing great work and providing it to the world to use in any way they need to. Um, a high school group in Alaska who's looking at Earth, uh, uh, the Earth's magnetic field has identified anomalies before an earthquake. You have to be close, within a few hundred kilometers. But if you're in that range, the anomalies in the XYZ of the magnetic field dramatically change in the 
in the hours and actually three days before the earthquake event, and the vector of that XYZ anomaly points right at the source of the earthquake. This is a phenomenal thing that's happening. They actually, uh, here's where you can see an example of, of that anomaly occurring just before the event is the vertical line. The red just suggesting when it sort of stopped being anomalous. But as you can see, we, we definitely got a story here. What if we get the world sharing together the advancing of understanding where earthquakes are coming from and, and preparing to, you know, be ready for that so we can shut down big industry and, and the like in the process. It would save a lot of lives and a lot of money. Here's another example of an event, and here it is going anomalous. There it is having occurred. So these high school kids in Alaska doing this. If you go to this website, we won't do it right now, but if you go to this website, esp.trillionlearning.com, you'll see this data live. You'll see all these sensors all those things right here that you're seeing, you'll see all of this live. You'll see the magnetic field being <coughs> delivered to you live in terms of it shifting around. And there's graphs on the page to show things in time so you can actually see the anomalous part. Extraordinary work by these high school kids. Um, this was another winner. This is a gentleman from a PhD student from Polytechnic di Milano. And uh, we're gonna show a video that, that shows some of this. I better hurry up. This is earthquake. Um, a uh, uh, seismic history uh, visualization. So if you want to look at, let's say, tw 20 years of seismic data for a particular area, it shows it at depth. You can't see that here right now, but it shows it at depth. And so you can see the subducting plate. It also shows it over time. So you can see where, in some cases, how the, the particular seismic events moving through history in terms of, let's say, moving more northward type of thing, which is not unusual. Um, and then again, we've got a SpaceBirds application that uh, shows where all the satellites are at any time, including uh, the Sentinel. So that's kind of fun. And then we have World Weather that shows all the currently available planetary data servers. We've got about 16 of them, I think almost 20, that you can now pull in right now, if this very moment, all the data that's available on those servers. It's all WMS and it's all it's NASA servers, it's uh, Europe servers, it's uh, Navy servers, and this is just an example. It's got either one globe or two globes or four globes all synchronized. You can put different data sets on different world, on different globes, zoom in and see what they're doing, and it's uh, pretty good. So we'll show you a video that uh, wraps it up, I hope. The video, I think, is five minutes. And So again, this is an open source, I'll just quickly talk to it. This is an open source project from uh, Politecnico di Milano, uh, Gabriella Presti Filippo, and it takes a lot of data and does all the stuff that you're seeing that happens in this video is, is not filmed. It is, is the actual application doing that particular work. And so if you need to analyze data, this happens to be phone calls, SMS messages, uh, time of day, length of time. Uh, that it happened and, and that kind of the concentration of activity there. So that's, they just were using that data to show the capability of this platform to visualize data, spatial data in context of uh, a large database. So we have four, we're going to see each one's about a minute. I still don't quite understand this one here, but uh, he included it. The globe that he's using underneath, you can see it's got the night sky and the day. That's something you can have by using just the basic whirlwind explorer. It, it's right there. You, you have that immediately. Um, this is the Quake Hunter uh, application, and you'll get a chance to see some of the, the depth to the data and uh, some of the story behind being able to see over 100 years of worth of data for the entire planet 
you can open this app right now and look at any area you want, over any time frame you want, over any depth range you want, or any magnitude range you want, and see all the data. And as you mouse over, it'll give you details, inform information about each one of those things. It also plots all of that data for you on charts on the right-hand side um, as well. So extraordinarily powerful. The, the, the tremendous thing about this is that this application was built by two students who came into my office for the summer and over 10 weeks, they didn't even start for the first two weeks, over eight weeks, they actually built this application. They had never written a line of JavaScript code in their life. They took WorldWind, USGS data, and built all these capabilities into it in less than two months. It's crazy how easy, and there you can see at depth all that seismic data, um, so you can get a sense of that Pacific plate sub subducting underneath the um, Asian plate and um, some of the activity with the, uh, the graphing. This one, we wanted, I wanted an application that showed where all the satellites were. This is all the satellites. Friends, we've got a mess up there. It's a dangerous mess. What you're seeing in the yellow is just the rocket body debris. The blue are the satellites. And you're not even seeing the small debris, which is red. You'll see that flash up here. And when you see the red, you say, oh my god, really? There it is. How do we get around all that with what we're sending up? It's quite amazing in terms of what's going on. So this allows you to see any satellite you want or group of satellites, their orbit, where they are right now, where they will be later on, anything you want. And we actually have a tool that allows you to change the time frame so that you can see when the satellites were actually put up. Um, and that's, that's interesting. Um, or the satellites just for any particular time period of when it was done, or for any nation. If you just want to see the satellites of Spain or the satellites of Italy, you can actually select that particular country and it'll show just those satellites. So there's just so many criteria that you can analyze the entire satellite world right now, including the debris that's up there, um, and we can learn a little bit more about what it is we're doing. There's, that's the orbit path. The, um, the green is the, uh, where it's going and the red is where it's been. Great tool for teaching about satellite, but also um, not bad for seeing where your satellite is and what it's up to. And I think the, the next one is, is uh, we'll pretty much wrap it up. I should mention, the, excuse me, the gentleman sitting up here is uh, Bert Stewart. Bert Stewart is a humanities major. He came into our office and joined our group for the summer, never written a line of computer code in his life. He and another gentleman are responsible for the application that you just saw. He had a lot of passion, studied really hard, and they actually had to coach him a lot, but he's a programmer now. So um, again, that's just how easy it is to play with Whirlwind in a functional and productive way. Um, this is world weather, and you see where it says available layers up here. Um, if you, when you click on that, you'll see all these diff there's different categories, four different categories, academia, government, um, weather, and uh, something else. And you'll see all the planetary servers that are available that have data, and we're just pulling data off of those servers, and it's thousands of, of layers of data. So you can get lost, but you also have a search tool where you type in, let's say, precipitation, and you see all the servers data that are carrying precipitation. You bring it in, you also have a legend that shows up over here that if you go to the uh, view, view options, you'll see a legend. And in that legend, you can actually go forward in time, backward in time for that particular data set. The amount of control and command you have over any data set you bring in is off the scale. So in terms of work and data, Inspire, we're delivering the data. Now start doing something with it. And so this is to show that that data is accessible, it's being delivered, it's being visualized, you can do analysis on it and start telling the stories that we got up here. And this is just to show off, this is the last thing, this is just to show off that it can do four globes at once. Thank you very much. for thoughts, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions afterwards. Uh, in, in <laughs> okay, so we continue now with the next presenter. It's uh, Alvaro, who will present us the GV SIG. So Alvaro, please, the floor is yours.
Hello. Um, so I'm going to present uh, one of these application of uh, NASA WorldWind uh, that we have integrated in our software GIS uh, and GBC. Um, so what, what are the, the goals of this integration? Uh, as you know, GBC is a, a complete uh, GIS desktop solution. It's written in Java and uh, well, I, I think I don't need to introduce any more WorldWind. Uh, and the, the goal is to have all this um, powerful globe uh, in GBC. Um, and why do we need a 3D, 3D in, in GIS? Um, I think it's long time that we are having uh, 3D uh, concept in GIS, but it's like still not exploding. But uh, it matters, and there is a lot of processes that you cannot really uh, visualize or analyze in 2D. Uh, like dynamic processes, simulation, flight simulations. It's also very useful for infrastructure planning, for tourism, and there is some problem that you can only solve using uh, 3D algorithms. And there, then there is also this stunning visualization uh, that you can do with this technology. And regarding the integration of uh, NASA WorldWin in GVC, um, how it works is that we have uh, the 2D uh, visualization, that's a standard 2D view of GBC with the layer, the symbology, and then uh, from, the, from this 2D view, you can request to create a 3D view, uh, which will open the, the globe. Uh, the globe is in, is in projection uh, WGS84, and all the layers uh, from the 2D view will be projected if necessary. If, if, the, if the 2D view is, any different, different, is in a different projection. The viewport uh, and, the, and the layers in between two views can be automatically synchronized or not. Uh, you can configure this. I will show it th this in, in some videos now. And we have uh, a spheric and flat modes also. We have an animation manager uh, to build some animations, uh, pro like programming animations uh, from, from these 3D visualizations. And then we also have this anaglyph mode in which uh, you can see with these two color glasses, like a real 3D uh, um, feeling. And one interesting thing about this integration is that um, you can load in, in the globe all the data sources that are available in GBC. That means that you can access all the remote services. Uh, for instance, the WMS services from the Spanish Ministry or, for, or from uh, Inspire European uh, services. Um, of course, you can load raster and vector layers. Regarding vector layers, we have like three modes, uh, like a raster, rasterized version of it, or um, a, a real 3D polygon if the if the set the, the elevation uh, information is, is in the layer, and you can also extrude a 2D layer to a 3D layer. I, I will show this in a video, and you can also load your own elevation models. So now I'm, I'm going to show you some videos. Um, Okay, so you see here we have a 2D view. Uh, this is uh, GBC. Uh, we have several layers load here, and now we open uh, the 3D view, and then we request to synchronize the viewports, um, and then you see in the 3D globe that is going to the same place we we are in the 2D view. Um, then uh, you you can actually play a bit with the elevation also. You have all the layers and the two views synchronized. The, the background uh, imagine, imaginary, it comes from, from a WMS service from the Spanish ministry. Uh, and as you, as you saw, when we were going, we were zooming in there at the beginning, it took a, a bit to load. And then when it's catch, it's really fast to navigate here. And then I'm going to show a different video. Um, about some raster data. So this is Corinne Land Cover. It's a European data set regarding uh, Land Cover. And yeah, well, 
uh, it showed like different classification, like uh, artificial areas, uh, agriculture, and uh, this uh, is. It's 2D information, but as the globe has uh, an elevation model, you can see how, how the, the information is, is shown uh, in, in 3D. Um, so it combines, you know, so, so you can actually get uh, this 3D visualization from 2D data. Then um, I'm going to show uh, extrusion of polygons. So this is a 2D layer of buildings, uh, but the buildings have a fill with the uh, height, uh, the, the number of, of buildings. So we are saying here that we want to use this field for extruding these two layers to a 3D layers. You could also set like a, a, a constant height and you will get also the extrusion. The extru the extrusion. Uh, or you can also so zoom the, the, the field and, the, um, and a constant value to, to get uh, uh, different effects. So you see, this is the 3D view with the extruded polygons. Now, when yeah, when you see when we uh, play with the angle, you see how we have converted this 2D layer to a 3D layer, and it was pretty fast. And then I'm going to show another one um, with some lidar data. Uh, this is uh, Legorreta, it's a small village in the north of Spain. I, I, we have in the background this satellite image from, from the ministry, the, uh, the, the WMS service. Um, and then uh, I have symbolized two different LiDAR data. You know LiDAR is this technology, laser technology, in which you get uh, clouds of points with elevation and sometimes some land cover classification. So I have symbolized uh, this uh, layer in two different ways, like in the height and uh, and the land cover classification. Uh, this is the height, the elevation. Um, so what we are sh showing here uh, is how it fits the the, the internal um, elevation model of the of the globe with the, the elevation data that is coming from the LiDAR and you can see in red, uh, from, from white to red, from more elevated to less, less elevated. And then uh, we also have this uh, land cover classification. Uh, so green is vegetation and red is, artific is artificial. Uh, and mm, I think uh, brown is just ter terrain. And you can uh, really see how it matches the, the data from the LiDAR with the data from the uh, orthophotograph. Um, like here, you see in, in, this, in these areas that it really matches. And let me show you one more video. Uh, how much time I have? Sorry. Five minutes? Okay. So. Uh, here I'm going to show you the uh, animation manager that you use to program uh, a specific movements and it's very useful to create uh, videos or visualizations um, because when you, you are exploring the 3D globe, uh, it's useful to move freely, but when you really want to present something uh, uh, for showing it later, it's better to program the points because the, the camera is moving this way in a more, more smooth way, you will, you will see in the, in the example. So here I'm saying I want to create a new animation using 3D spher uh, spherical view. And then I, I, I'm setting here with uh, these buttons on the right, like new points. I, I will set three or four points here. So what I'm doing here is I move the, the visualization and I set, I want the camera here. And then I move again and set the camera in another point, like here now. And then I can play it and it will go to all these, these uh, points with the exact angle and zoom, and it will interpolate the movement of the camera, which will work much smooth than if I do it by hand. And finally, um, let me uh, talk, talk about the future. Uh, that's uh, some ideas we have. It depends also on funding, but. 
uh, would like to implement like alphanumeric an annotations, some temporal data visualization, um, maybe using NetCDF format, um, 3D object objects in Colada format, which are used for, for building normally, uh, like having more complex uh, building shapes in 3D, and some tools to work with topographic profiles. And then, well, uh, in the two, in the, in the last GBC version 2.3, which uh, is uh, mm, is mm, being released, uh, I think, in some weeks, uh, this is already integrated, the 3D uh, view. And I also want to tell you about uh, another platform we have, which is GBC Online. It's totally different product from, from GBC Desktop, which I was showing now. Uh, it's a solution for publishing data on the web. Uh, it's also free software, and it makes very, very use, use, very, very easy to publish data, to manage this data, and say, uh, I'm, I want to create this and this map, and I want to make this map public, or I can create, I can manage users and group, and say that this group of users can see these maps or can edit exactly this layer in a very, very uh, easy way. Uh, tomorrow I, I'm going to present a, a, an SDI for the uh, International Union of, Union of Nature Conservation based on this GBC online software and you have the opportunity to, to see a bit more about this. But mm, and, uh, we have a experimental 3D super here in GBC online also using NASA World well, Wind and I'm going to show also a video. Um, So this is um, GBC Online, how it looks. Uh, you enter with your user and you have a dashboard and depending on your permission, you will see different things here, like that mm, layer management, user management, or, or just the, the maps that you can access if you are a normal user. And uh, now we are switching to the 3D view uh, that, as I said, is using the uh, web whirlwind and you have different tools uh, to access the, the, this is accessing actually uh, some data publishes in, in GBC Online um, and you can um, query the attribute table or play with the transparency and uh, like getting inform information in the point and well, maybe it's enough. Thank you. Thank you, Alvarez. This was also a very, very interesting presentation. And we move on. We have now two presentations actually on QGIS. So first we start with Joanna. Joanna, please, floor is yours. So, hello, good afternoon, and thanks for being here. So, I'm going to be talking about uh, Quantum GIS now. So, I would like to start by asking uh, who of you are Quantum GIS users? Could you please raise your hands? Okay, so we, we have a lot of ears, users here. So, I probably don't need to explain a lot uh, about what is Quantum GIS. So, it's a desktop, free and open source GIS. It's, uh, becoming extremely popular. As you can see in this uh, map, it map of users from uh, later this year, um, even when compared with uh, more mature projects or proprietary systems, Quantum GIS is still uh, very much uh, used. Um, and one of its strengths is that uh, although it's programmed in uh, C++, uh, it exposes a, a Python API. So there are uh, literally hundreds of, of plugins which extend the, the core func functionality uh, and that fulfill uh, 
diverse needs for uh, specific uh, use cases. So I will start with a little bit of history of uh, metadata in uh, Quantum GIS. So in the very first release, uh, there was actually no, no, no metadata. So what you could see was a, a, a metadata tab on the property uh, window was uh, actually uh, um, uh, the output of uh, GDAL info and OGR info. And then there was a long period of uh, silence. And in 2009, Alex Mandel developed the meta edit plugin. So this was uh, at first a, a read only plugin. And later there was some write support also implemented. But it, it had uh, uh, this interesting concept of showing uh, metadata as, as a tree, so a, a hierarchical view of uh, metadata. In the, uh, this project, uh, unfortunately, in the next year, in 2010, uh, died, so there were no more, more developments. Uh, at the same time, in 2009, Samsung developed um, the first CSW client for uh, Quantum G's. Um, the key GCSW, which uh, had quite uh, some issues, but uh, it also attracted the attention over this, this topic. And so in the next year, uh, Linfinity with the next GIS uh, created the CSW client, which was uh, uh, another CSW client, which became uh, extremely popular. Uh, in 2011, uh, also Linfinity, together with Next.js, they wrote the first implementation of the, the MetaTools plugin. So this was a, a tool for altering metadata. And it reused uh, some of the ideas of the, the, the MetaEdit plugin, so the, the tree hierarchy, but it was completely uh, written from scratch because the other project was no longer active. So. Uh, MetaTools uh, introduces a, a lot of uh, new features, like, for instance, the, the use of templates, uh, automated uh, metadata extraction, uh, some support to profiles. Um, so it was, a, a quite, uh, it was a, a quite a complete uh, tool for uh, authoring metadata. Uh, but th this project uh, also stopped in uh, 2013. And in 2014, uh, Tom Kralidis forked the, the CSW client and he created the, the meta search plugin. Uh, and this was, uh, he added a few more features like a, a tighter integration. And, and this became the, actually the second most download plugin of uh, Quantum GIS. And um, now in 2015, it was uh, integrated in the course. So it now it's part of the standard in installation of, uh, of Quantum GIS. So what you could see from the, the previous slide is that there are basically uh, three groups uh, uh, with, of functionality concerning metadata in uh, Quantum GIS. So one is the ability to, to alter metadata, to create uh, metadata. The other one uh, concerns uh, the connecting to, to catalogs. And finally, the first one has to do with the uh, metadata properties that are built in the core. So up to now, these three sets of functionality have been uh, disconnected. So they have been implemented in many parts of the code and not reusing uh, uh, functionality made by others, maybe because this is also done by plugins, so it's difficult to, to reuse the functionality. So there was no really a strategy for metadata in Quantum GIS. Uh, you can see here a timeline of, of what I described. So you can see the first group, the authoring uh, metadata, um, uh, components, which are the, the meta edit, which later evolved to, to meta tools. Then in, in the center, you have the, the CSW clients, with, uh, which finished with a meta search as a core plugin. And finally, we have the layer properties. So the, the layer properties, I, I said in the beginning, they, they were very basic. So um, there were some, the, the metadata of the layer properties evolved to include some more elements. And this was mostly for the benefit of Quantum GIS servers. So as you may know, in the last re latest releases of Quantum GIS, uh, uh, it's included uh, uh, OWS server. 
Uh, and so the, what you see in the metadata properties uh, of the layers is uh, basically to, to feed the information of, of the get capabilities response. So what is the current status? Uh, well, as I said before, there is no currently no support in, uh, in the core of Quantum GIS for exporting metadata in any standards-based uh, metadata formats. Yeah, and there is also no support to publish uh, in uh, catalogs. So if you search uh, in the latest version of Quantum G, so the, the, the master branch of, of GitHub, if you, if you enter this version and you search through the Quantum GIS uh, plugin repository, you will find six plugins that are uh, related to metadata. Uh, half, half of these plugins are, are broken for this version because the, there were some changes in, in the API and they didn't catch up yet with the, with the changes. But in, in any case, we are, we are going to go quickly uh, through them to, to see what, what they are doing. So, th so the first one uh, I already talked about is the, the meta search, which is now a, a core plugin. And this is a, a, a CSW client, so it allows you to to connect to a server, browse through the, the records, and if there is uh, any um, OGC uh, service uh, attached to, to, to it, it allows you to, to pull the resource and load it directly into the Quantum GIS. So that, that, this plugin is not under a, a lot of development lately, and the fact that it's a plugin and, and that this functionality is not on the core, it makes it also a little bit difficult to, to reuse. The other plugin that I, I mentioned, MetaTools, uh, it's uh, so the closest that we have from, from a tool to author uh, metadata. So it allows you to, to view and create metadata. It supports two standards. Uh, and he has a, a, a lot of uh, nice features. Um, the approach that they, they took is to store the metadata locally in an XML file, which is similar to what uh, ArcGIS is doing, I think. Um, and it's, it's a plugin that is, um, is quite used. Then we have uh, another set of plugins. Uh, so th these, these two are, are quite generic. And then we have another set of plugins that are actually like focusing on a specific uh, needs and specific uh, use cases. So the, this is the case of the Inspire uh, plugin. So this is a plugin that basically qu queries the catalog and it uses uh, Genetoric XML API, uh, and it allows you, if you have a, a, a spatial resource, it also allows you to, to load it uh, directly into Quantum GIS. So it, uh, it's, it supports a nice feature, which is the, the filter by Inspire team. And we have the Atom client, which is a really a, a client for the download services for Inspire, so you can connect to Atom feeds, and also load the layers into, into Quantum Gs. Uh, then we, we have the SEC for Quantum Gs, and this plugin was developed uh, here in Spain for a very specific use case, so to work with the cartography of the Spanish cadastral electronic site. So the idea was to be able to import data from a SEC in the, in the, in the formats, the DXF, GML, edit this data, and then export it in uh, Inspire GML, which is the, the format that you need to use if you want to uh, submit officially the, these, these changes, these results. Uh, the, the Seekin browser is a client, uh, so for uh, servers that are implementing the, the Seekin stan standards, so open data, and it also allows you to, to browse uh, through the resources and, and load any geographical data in, into quantum GIS. So regarding the, the core properties, uh, as I said before, there is a, a, a metadata tab uh, on the layer properties that adds some, some information. And also in the, in the project uh, settings, um, there is a o OWS uh, server tab, which allows you to put a little bit more information about metadata. And uh, this is going to be used uh, to configure 
the get capabilities response of the Quantum GS server. So you can actually make it uh, inspire compliant if you feel these uh, properties. So all this this metadata is not designed to be to be portable. Uh, it's uh, stored actually within the the project file of Quantum GS. But as I said, it's designed to 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 be used with the Quantum GS server. Okay, so now is the point that I, I look at the crystal ball and talk a little bit about the, the future of metadata. Uh, and there was already, uh, in 2015, there was a, already a, an effort from uh, Tom Krelidis to, to design a, a metadata strategy for quantum Gs, uh, focusing on two of the aspects that, that, that I mentioned before. So one is the, the metadata management uh, uh, that is, uh, should be on the, on the core, and the other one is to allow to publish to, um, to catalogs. So not only to, to view data from CSW servers, but also to, to publish data. Uh, and in August this year, uh, there was actually uh, some initiative from the Norwegian Institute for Natural Research which, have, which work a lot with metadata, so they, they created some momentum around uh, this topic, and actually um, it ended up in a discussion group that got together to, to talk about a, a possible roadmap to, to implement uh, these changes. Uh, and well, we, we agree that uh, by implementing these features that you, you can see here in this slide, we could provide a pretty stable and, and solid support for metadata in quantum Gs. So one, I think the basic one, would be to support uh, metadata management in the core so that it could be reused, the functionality could be reused by, by plugins. Uh, the other one has to do with the, the, the catalogs. So uh, I, I put in brackets support metadata browsing because this is also already uh, supported by the, the core plugin, the meta search, but it will be important also to publish uh, metadata. And um, so there is a, a plugin Ge uh, Geocat Bridge that is being developed for ArcGIS and that allows you to, to publish data, metadata and symbology in uh, OGC based services. So uh, I think it would be uh, nice to have something similar to this in Quantum Gis so that you could be working and then publish uh, directly uh, your results. The, um, the last thing that uh, I wanted to mention is the, so the support to serve metadata. So this is obviously re related to the Quantum GIS server product. So we were discussing like the possibility of in including a CSW server in, in a Quantum GIS server, maybe based on PyCSW. Uh, okay, so uh, do I have time? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to finish up, I want to, to make a, use this opportunity to make a call for uh, support. So the Nina Institute is uh, willing to, to fund uh, the developments that I describe, but these are uh, quite some changes. I mean, some of them are, are core changes, so there is a, it requires a lot of uh, programming efforts. So I think uh, we'll be looking for uh, more contributors who are interested in this to maybe join a, a fi funding pool so that we, we can make uh, uh, this uh, go forward. So if you, if you are interested, if you think this could be uh, something useful, uh, please, please get in touch. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you are a developer or, or, or you are a metadata expert and you would like to contribute uh, with um, code or with uh, uh, ideas, we have created a, um, a channel. It's not Slack, it's a glitter channel. Uh, so please, uh, please join and, and share your ideas with us. Uh, and to finish, I, I would like to, to conclude that uh, I believe that these announcements are, would be very important because the, the lack of metadata support in Quantum Gs is something that is still uh, putting people a bit off to use uh, Quantum Gs as their primary tool, as their primary uh, desktop JS. So if we would implement this, I think this would be a, a very good contribution for the, the Quantum GIS project. 
Um, and I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joanna. Very, very interesting. Uh, we go to the last one, and then we will open the floor for the questions. So the last uh, will be not Paul, who is actually not with us today. It will be by Francois. So Francois, please, the floor is yours. Okay, so this presentation uh, is about uh, different initiatives in the last two years uh, around QGIS and improving the GML uh, application schema uh, support in, the, in this project. Uh, here you have a set of logos, so on top the supporters and at the bottom the developers mainly. Uh, so my name is uh, Francois Pruner. Uh, I will present this work with Sylvain Grelet from BRGM. Uh, and we are working with GRC, Paul Asnor, uh, and Christian here from EEA uh, on this topic. Uh, the basic idea uh, here is to uh, break the circle of no data, no software, and try to uh, make open source projects uh, improve uh, and be able to deal with uh, GML application schema uh, data, which could be inspired data sets, but also uh, other uh, OGC, uh, GML uh, data set. So a quick history, uh, last year uh, we have been uh, working on uh, a study on what would be the best scenario uh, to better support uh, this uh, in QGIS. Uh, after this work uh, made for EEA, uh, uh, BRGM was working with Oslandia on a proof of concept uh, beginning of this year and now we are uh, making more progress uh, on QGIS and uh, JDAL uh, to improve this. So the basic idea is to uh, be able to consume a GML file coming from WFS services or uh, from GML files, local files, uh, process them and be able to do something in QGIS uh, based on this. So the main challenges uh, for this is be able from the specifications or from the XSD uh, to do, to create a database structure related to this uh, and generic process to convert this uh, and try to make something usable at the end in the desktop GIS uh, and to have a reusable work that it work with Inspire uh, data sets but also Geo, GeoSciML or uh, different uh, data models. So this work is based on open source project, uh, mainly uh, on JDAL. So JDAL is a library to read and write different GIS formats. So we are currently adding a read and write uh, driver, new driver uh, for GML application schema uh, into this library. So if then if you have an application using JDAL, you will be able to uh, get benefits uh, from this new driver. So in QGIS, uh, using JDAL, uh, we will be able to uh, open and work uh, with this uh, input format. Uh, so we uh, identified the generic development uh, to be done in QGIS, like uh, improving uh, relation support, uh, support new advanced type, like uh, supporting array types in databases, and be able to add custom uh, widgets. And then, uh, this will be work on, on the core of QGIS, and then if we have any specific work to be done uh, related to Inspire, uh, we, this will be part of a plugin. Uh, so uh, JDAL will take care of the conversion. We are mainly focusing on converting from GML uh, to spatial light and post GIS, uh, and then you can use this database in QGIS. So BRGM was working uh, beginning of this year on the proof of concept. Uh, now we are working also with the WFS2 plugin and currently we are uh, looking into combining all this work uh, and we are working on this uh, this week. 
So the new driver in JDAL will be GML IS for application schema. So I will not go into details, but if you are used to uh, JDAL commands, then you can uh, do similar OGR info or conversion with uh, JDAL, uh, OGR utilities uh, using the driver. We define the conversion, so you will be able from the schema to be able to create a database uh, which match uh, the object model. Uh, it will uh, have some, it will support the different uh, XSD types. It will do some simplifications for, depending on the cardinal cardinalities of types, uh, support some uh, X-link support, uh, cache the, the schema, and validate uh, the documents. There will be options for configuration. I will not go in detail in this. Uh, so when once uh, we have the driver, we are able to create uh, inspired database from the GML uh, document uh, with a set of objects, tables, and relations, and so on. And the idea is then to be able to use this database is, uh, in QGIS. So in QGIS, uh, there will be uh, a plugin uh, based on uh, OGR utility to do the conversion from the GML file to the database, and then you will be able to use the database in, in QGIS. Uh, so this is the samples uh, we are currently working on. So it could be uh, EU uh, data sets like CDDA, uh, biogeographical regions, land cover, and so on. So then you can combine uh, the same data sets from different member states in the same database, and this is the target uh, of this um, project. Uh, current work, uh, we are also working on QGIS core, so to um, make it easier to discover join between table, because in table you have relational model, so uh, QGIS could uh, learn from the model the, the foreign key and so on to help user uh, adding, add the layer to the QGIS. So we are working on uh, improving this part. Uh, and we also added some uh, widgets. For example, if you have array types in a database, so you, you will be able to edit the database in QGIS also uh, and better support this. Uh, so this is the work we are currently uh, doing. And uh, BRGEM uh, made a similar part of, uh, in the plugin of the proof of concept, so converting GML to uh, to a database or to XML format, and they also uh, investigate more advanced features uh, in this plugin that Sylvain is going to describe. Okay, thank you, Francois. Uh, so basically, the idea of this proof of concept with BRGM was to consume Inspire compliant flows we have for some lab with our groundwater monitoring devices, piezometers, the aquifers, and the sensor observation services. The underlying idea was if it can work on any complex feature, it could work on top of WFS, but also SOS, for example. Anyway, the XML instance point to XSD. So uh, what we've done is basically what presented Francois, conversion from the XML down to a database, but we also explored, explore, explored in a, how to handle XML mod, so without any relational database right, the logic here, uh, but into a more advanced way. And so, like I said uh, in that screenshot, it's basically querying the description of a monitoring facility measuring groundwater level, export according to Inspire, and basically all the references to code lists to other features are made in a resolvable URI fashion. So what is interesting is it enables the, the, the end user to retrieve more and more information. And in that example, the facility uses what's defined in Inspire, there is a as observation stuff linking the facility to observation and measurement. Then you just have the URI of the offering, and then if you're interested in that, you can retrieve queries that you arrive and add the content to your interface. So what is nice is that then you retrieve the content, and here we, st we started to explore sort of kind of outcoded uh, with yet because all the rest that was presented is generic, but at some point if you want to have some GUI, some user interface stuff, you need to outcode this kind of stuff. So here the WaterML2 uh, structure was mapped to just to plot a graph. But what is interesting is there is, it's completely dynamic to just retrieve the content and you generate, to populate a widget out of that. And also um, that was for the XML uh, content negotiation and enriching stuff. And the other aspect was, okay, my main, 
and worries was to transfer standardized content properly, that work, but then you realize people will get scared now handling the database. So we tried to generate some kind of also tiny widget, a couple hours, just so that you get an overview of the generated da data structure within Spatialite or post, uh, post GIS. And now we need to explore more user-friendly ways of actually make use of data sets. First job is almost done, transferring standardized information, then using it. I guess you want to say something more after that? Yeah, what's next? So what's next? Um, so currently we are uh, in the process uh, of this work uh, in JDAL and QG, so we are uh, testing it with Inspire datasets and uh, datasets from geology and hydro, groundwater, ML, and other datasets. Uh, we have set we have a virtual box to make it easier uh, to test uh, because we are planning to uh, make this work available in the coming version of JDAL and QGIS, which means JDAL 2.2, which is planned uh, beginning of next year, and QGIS 3, which is also will be a major release of QGIS, which is also planned uh, beginning of next year. Uh, so this is our uh, planning on this work. So the uh, plugin uh, made by BRGM uh, is av available since uh, July, August, uh, and works with QGIS 2.14. Uh, and now uh, we have the JDAL uh, read reader part uh, available and uh, some work made on QGIS. And we have the virtual box for testing uh, all these together. And before the end of the year, the, the idea is to continue the work and be able also to write uh, the data back from the database to the GML, uh, GML file uh, and work on the plugin. So the idea is to combine the work made on the proof of, of concept with the WFS2 uh, plugin and uh, any specific uh, GML application schema driver uh, made. So this will be, uh, the target is end of this year and it will be really part of the open source uh, project beginning of next year. So we are uh, working on it, uh, and we are supporting publication of JDL 2.2 uh, and QGIS 3, working with the core developer of this project. Uh, the idea is also to have more users and uh, have people uh, using it, uh, reporting usage with different uh, type of data sets and not only Inspire ones. Uh, and then the idea is to enhance the work, so to, uh, closer, to uh, close, closely link uh, what has been done uh, for SOS or uh, XML uh, view mode in the proof of concept in the, uh, um, the main work made uh, in JDOL. Uh, so this is not Inspire specific and could be used with any application schema uh, based on GML. And there is some links, so if you are more used to JDAL, you can already uh, go on those places and build your own uh, JDAL version or QGIS uh, version with uh, these features uh, in. We also going to publish the work on the Inspire Myth uh, organization on GitHub, uh, where there is already some uh, open source work uh, made. Uh, so the documentation, for example, will be uh, published uh, in this uh, place. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, perfect. So we have almost 10 minutes, I think, for the questions and discussions. And uh, actually, as a chairman, may maybe I will take my right to pose the first question. <laughs> and I would like to ask Patrick, if you can come and stand in the microphone. Uh, Patrick, uh, my question would be, from your perspective or from NASA perspective, how do you see Inspire is progressing. You said you are following it already for three years, so starting from Florence, no? How do you see Inspire is progressing from your perspective and or from NASA perspective? And where do you see or how we can more improve this connection between Inspire and let's say World Wind and, and your, what you are doing? Please. You know, the, the thing that I, I notice and, uh, and maybe tunnel vision and, and high expectations, so I, I, I experienced some 
degree of frustration. But um, I, I come to these Inspire conferences, and, and I continually hear us talking about data and access and delivery. And I see um, not near enough delivered data, not near enough working with the data, showing what we've done with the data. And, and particularly with regard to how we can share these solutions with each other. So we're not just showing off a business model that's successful. We're actually, and, and the key to, I think, getting to that point is challenging the university community, challenging the students of computer science to say, look, here's Inspire. You, this is what you deliver something that's of value. Here's the data, and then here's what we want to see. Believe me, they will challenge you know, the business community extraordinaire in terms of providing results. And then those results are open source, and so that's where we can start getting um, deliverables instead of, um, I mean, we, continue, we just talk about the data, the data, the data, and protocol, and the new protocol, and the next new protocol, and how we're complying with the protocol. I'm saying break the damn rule. Don't comply with the protocol. Show some results with the data. If it doesn't quite fit, we'll straighten that out later, but show some results with the data. And everyone's so darn worried about making sure they align with what they're supposed to do. Nothing gets done. And so um, I, I, I feel like I'm at the 2013 conference all over again. And that's, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, the floor is open. Please. Also for comments, not only questions. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Maybe, Patrick, again. The city of Springfield, Oregon, um, has decided to build an, a, a, an urban management application for their entire city. You know, fire, water, um, emergency response, um, infrastructure, water, sewer, power, everything. They're, going, they're building that now, and they're building it with the mind of being open source as part of what you know, NSDI, the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, is an executive, U.S. executive order for the same thing the Inspire, repre uh, Inspire Directive represents. We, I challenge any city who wants to get serious about providing solutions as a world leader to talk to me and the, the uh, city of Springfield, Oregon, will work with you and share everything they've got in terms of the application that's gonna, that is open source that, that we can actually challenge, tempt, charm the world to start working together from the, from the ground up, from the city management uh, space on up. And if we do that, we'll, we've got too much of a world that's in a mess right now and not enough places where the world's collaborating and working together. So I'm saying cross the boundaries, break the rules, let's find ways where we're connecting on a very productive level, delivering solutions that we actually are serving our own needs and yet we can share it with anyone else who needs it, especially the poor cities, let's say, and then we can all benefit by some of the solutions that are derived there. And at the same time, ask the university community to start delivering, the, help us deliver those, you know, say, you deliver it. And then let's see what you come up with. Let's not coordinate, just tell them, deliver it, let's see what you come up with. And if the European community would actually provide awards so that there's some financial incentive to these students, whether it's a trip, whether it's money, um, I think we're gonna start seeing things and they will self-organize. Don't force it to comply with something. They will self-organize into solutions that start working, I think, I hope, I wish. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, there is one question, uh, okay. It's, it's a good first. one. Uh, it's for Patrick. So um, I, I only know the, the Java, Java API. Um, you, you used to allow you to do like an applet and put it in uh, in application. So the JavaScript API, is it similar? Do you have the same kind of functionality or is it uh, more limited? No, it, it, yeah, the, 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 Java, uh, um, the JavaScript version is not an applet. It's a full-blown you know, web application. So you're, you're, you're in a different, you know, better, much uh, better territory. In terms of functionality, we're getting there. So with the with European Space Agency and NASA, now Tali's has also joined us in terms of developing the web version, the JavaScript version. 
we're going to start making some very significant headway that will, if functionalities aren't there that you need, let's find out what those are and let's make, make those happen. So this is, uh, um, yeah, this is not the applet, this is the JavaScript. So, Ben. Uh, there was a one question in the back, I think, one hand there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joris Andalinas. I'm a researcher for the uh, Space Institute of Satellite, uses in Toulouse. Uh, it's more a remark than a question in the line that Professor Hogan was referring to. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of enemies now, but uh, it's not my, my intention. I think we're almost 50 years late because yesterday, for instance, I was attending at a conference regarding marine data and barely there were 20 people. I mean, Copernicus uh, in the uh, my ocean, former Myosian program and now the Copernicus program regarding marine protection has invested tons of money, like millions of dollars, just to bring applications from space to Earth. And only 20 people were there. So we have a huge issue regarding marine mammal extinction in this regard. The press is all over. In September, Science Magazine, uh, just release an issue regarding the importance of preserving marine life. So we should go further and if not breaking the rules so far, at least just to push more the industry in this regard, because we depend upon seas. If the marine life just goes, uh, goes extinct, then the whole life of humans, I don't see it going much further. So yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. Thank, thank you for this comment. I completely agree. Uh, any any other questions, comments? Uh, there's one. Uh, what is? Well, just a comment in relation with uh, this evolution of Inspire. And I, I was thinking, well, well, while well, you were speaking, Patrick, and also thinking on the presentation of Joanna, that we we also in GBC had a, a, this uh, catalog client, CSW client for a lot of years, but then new versions of standards are, are coming and we are not uh, maybe uh, able to keep uh, the pace and then it, it gets not enough uh, attention, it gets discontinued like it's happening quantum years for several times. So uh, maybe the, mm, one, one thing to learn from this is that, uh, well, WMS, uh, I think it has been a successful protocol and also WMTS, so maybe we need a sim more simple protocol. So maybe that, that's because uh, when it's so so expensive to, to, to implement and also to keep uh, maintaining the software for speaking these protocols, I don't know. I, of course, we have built something very big now and I don't mean that we have to, to take this down, but Maybe, maybe when administration are publishing data, they should think maybe, maybe we follow the standard, but we also offer a, a simple, more simple API, like this JSON for, for, for geographic data and other similar things. And maybe there, there will arise some users of these simple protocols. Simplification, in other words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, we are perfectly on time. <laughs> so once uh, I would like just to say thank you all for being here in this session with us. And first of all, also thank to, to our presenters once again. Thank you.